if you can keep the applause down and so forth because we're trying to record this and any sound gets picked up by the <coughs> microphone. So first of all, I want to welcome all of you. And since we have some, I think I know everybody, but I'm David Tolbert. I'm the president of the International Center of Transitional Justice, where you are. And a warm welcome to our visitors here and then, of course, to our staff. Um, I'm very honored today to have, uh, to have some distinguished guests. Uh, and I have a rumor that the president of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, Judge Agius, may walk in. So if you see a very distinguished gentleman walk through the door, that will be possibly the president of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And uh, maybe I'll stop and do a quick, a quick introduction of them. We have some other visitors, a number of them, some from The Hague, some from, from up, uh, uptown New York, and it's great to have them. And a couple of other visitors I'll introduce in a moment. Um, I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this discussion. I think the Harara and Nambia genocide is something that is not very well known. And we have two distinguished experts here to talk about that genocide and also talk about some very innovative legal approaches to try to take accountability, to have accountability for that genocide. Um, ICTJ is all about accountability, so we're very interested in hearing about this. Interestingly enough, I was in Germany myself last week, and of course Germany bears the responsibility for this genocide, and uh, there were discussions there about this, so I think this is an encouraging uh, encouraging sign. We talked a bit about it in Nuremberg at the uh, Nuremberg uh, Principals <coughs> Academy Board of Advisors, and then it came up in my meetings in Berlin, too. So this is a very timely uh, event, and uh, many will trace the Holocaust um, to the genocide in, uh, in the early 1900s in what is now present-day Namibia. Uh, so I think this is a timely, uh, a timely uh, event. I also wanted to just take a few moments to uh, talk about my uh, good friend John Jones, who uh, died uh, very prematurely recently. And I'm very pleased that his uh, aunt and uncle, Harriet and Charlie Day, are here with us. So welcome to, to ICTJ. Uh, John, I knew from 1996. Uh, I don't know whether it was the first day I joined the Yugoslavia Tribunal or the second or the third, but it was within the first week. And he wandered down and we became friends from thereafter. He, at that point, was working for President Kaseza and uh, uh, we, we formed a very lively relationship. Uh, he even uh, stayed in my house in our house while he was while he was away while we were away, and John was a very good lawyer even back in uh, 1996. Very spirited, lots of ideas. Uh, he would drive me to exhaustion with his ideas <laughs> about the law, uh, uh, and uh, we were friends for uh, continued that friendship for a long time. He he ultimately, of course. Uh, did other things. He was a defense counsel. He became Queen's counsel at a very early age, which was uh, quite distinguished. Uh, uh, and I can remember uh, when I was in the prosecution side, our uh, hearing, well, Tolbert, you better turn on the television. John Jones is whipping your prosecutors in there. So he was always a very lively advocate, a very strong advocate. Um, and a person with a lot of humor and fun. Uh, he could mimic accents like you wouldn't believe. He, uh, I think he could have joined Pom Monty Python if he had not, mm -hmm. if he had not, uh, not decided to go to the bar. So uh, his untimely death at 48 is a real tragedy for our community as lawyers. Um, um, but I think John will be remembered by all of us for the rest of our lives. He made a tremendous mark uh, through a number of, uh, a lot of work at the international level, but also the domestic level. And uh, I didn't know about his engagement uh, on, on this genocide. So this is, uh, it's, uh, I can't say I'm too surprised that he was engaged now that I know something about it. But he, was, he had his fingers in a lot of places. And uh, he will be deeply missed. And I, I, I I was really uh, staggered by by his uh, by his passing, but we wanted to take the opportunity to talk <coughs> about this important issue, but also 
uh, honor John here uh, at ICTJ for the work that he did and then with his colleagues in The Hague. So uh, I'd like to now turn it over to our two presenters. Um, and we have uh, Robert Mertfeld, who's currently working in the field of communications at Cambridge Analytica. He oversees the firm's commercial operations in the New York office, um, which is built on the successes that the organization has had in the political market. And prior to that, he worked with John Jones himself um, when John was uh, a barrister. And he actually uh, has come up with this uh, very innovative approach to try to uh, have accountability under arbitration, uh, which he conceived together with John. So he's, uh, he has a wide uh, variety of uh, experiences and and also has a degree in law, psychology, and economics. Um, then to give us uh, uh, a strong background on the, uh, on, the, on the genocide itself, we have, uh, we have um, Sakara, Sakara, who has a, has a, has a very interesting background um, in which he's, uh, he's worked extensively on the genocide. Um, he's a genocide scholar, he's a lawyer himself. He studied at Victoria, I believe, in South Africa. Um, and ICDJ very much comes out of the South African experience, so you're at home now here as well. Uh, so he will help give us uh, some of the background of the genocide and, and uh, share some of his insights and knowledge. Uh, so why don't I turn it over to the two of you, and sure. whoever goes first goes first, and uh, hopefully we can uh, save some time for questions and discussions. So yeah. Robert, so you start first? Right. right. Um, well, thank you so much for everybody for coming, first of all. Um, I'm really delighted about the turnout. Uh, this event is extremely important to me personally, because I knew John Jones quite, uh, uh, you know, as a friend. Uh, me and John, uh, we met through the Libya cases at the International Criminal Court of Justice and I actually assisted John Jones in the defense of Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, uh, trying to mastermind uh, the um, uh, surrender obligation of Libya to be implemented by the UN Security Council here in New, in, here in New York. So his passing is a huge tragedy uh, for many people and many people in Namibia as well where you know, we embarked on a second case after the Saif Gaddafi case together where he just touched so many people. And the idea is really that he will be remembered uh, through his work and through his cases that continue to live on. They, uh, the friends of the ICC at the United Nations kindly remembered him when the prosecutor he just recently visited and gave a speech there. So uh, I will be really representing both John Jones and the Herrera genocide here today. Um, on the Herrera Nama genocide, uh, Skara, who uh, is visiting us from Namibia, it's fantastic that he's here. He's a genocide scholar and a legal scholar, and um, he's sitting here on behalf of the paramount chief of the Herrera, um, named Bikuru Kuru, uh, who is the former attorney general of Namibia and became the paramount chief of the Herrera, uh, I think, September last year. Uh, Mr. Rukuru is, uh, was John Jones's client. Uh, Kirsty Brimlow QC of Doughty Street has now taken over the case and um, uh, we will get into the nitty-gritty detail of what we have devised as an option for the Herrero and the Nama uh, to receive justice but um, it borders a bit on the surreal because uh, the very same day that we lost John Jones uh, that was 18th of um, uh, April uh, he actually had signed the letter announcing to the Federal Republic of Germany that we will now proceed uh, with uh, enacting an arbitration process uh, under a bilateral investment treaty that exists between Germany and Namibia. And that letter was signed by him and then he died at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and it wasn't sent. Uh, so uh, it's really to you know, re-energize the case and you know, continue the case in the spirit of John and uh, we're actually thinking about as well if we ever manage to get an actual settlement from Germany to have a certain percentage go of that settlement to his family um, as a memorial fund. So, a um, couple of words about myself still and the Herrero. Um, I'm German myself, uh, I'm in my mid-30s. Uh, I became involved with the Herrero genocide uh, in my early 20s. I've been engaged with this topic now beyond 10 years. 
Uh, I travel to Namibia, uh, I lived among the Oberherero community, I carry, I carry a Herero name, uh, yeah. <laughs> which means the strange one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm betraying my country uh, by uh, taking that action forward. No, I'm joking. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a genocide that is a, a true genocide, and we will um, take you through a couple of details of what happened uh, during the years of 1904 and 1908, um, uh, and it's just something that needs resolving, and it needs proper resolving. So I think, you know, we really want this to be an interactive discussion, and me and Skara will jointly present. Uh, I have just three slides as some images as a background, um, how to take this forward. Uh, if these slides are actually working. Fantastic. So um, here you see um, John Jones uh, in the middle. This was the uh, launch of the case at Doughty Street Chambers uh, in the summer last year. Uh, to the left you see Vikuru Kuru, uh, the paramount chief of the Herero. Here you see um, a member of parliament of Namibia uh, from the Nama community, uh, another tr uh, traditional chief and another grouping more traditional chiefs of the Herero to the right. Um, so this image will always be with us due to the fact that it happened as an event. Um, we had a very dignifying ceremony on that day too uh, in the parliament, uh, the British parliament. The British Parliament is hugely important for the Herero genocide because uh, when uh, Namibia, uh, what was German Southwest Africa as a colony, uh, before was uh, conquered by the British uh, during the World War I effort, the British in 1915 uh, started an investigation in uh, then German Southwest Africa and then Southwest Africa, documenting oral testimonies of genocide survivors in order to produce an official account which became known as the Blue Book. And the Blue Book uh, um, is the official Western uh, testi uh, um, testimony to that the genocide actually occurred by having written down oral testimony of survivors. So the Blue Book um, was published in 1918. Uh, the purpose of the Blue Book was to um, uh, dispossess Germany of its colonial empire. Uh, on the grounds to argue that Germany is not capable of bringing civilization to the African continent. So it had clearly you know, other motives, but uh, through, through that accident of history, the actual uh, document was produced, um, and it survived a, a very interesting story, because in 1926, when Germany and Britain again became friends, uh, a decision was taken to destroy all copies of the Blue Book and erase that actual memory again from the international uh, history. So copy survived, one copy survived in the British Parliament, and uh, when we launched the case uh, through the arbitration route in the bilateral investment treaty between Germany and Namibia, we actually visited the Parliament prior, and there are more photos of that, um, where the Herrero and the Nama uh, visited uh, the original copy in the, of the Blue Book uh, in Parliament. So this is really to give you an impression now, and uh, I really want Skara to elaborate a bit um, on what happened um, uh, during the years of 1904 to 1908. What you see behind us is survivors um, from the Omaheke Desert. Uh, the war broke out between the Herero and the Germans in January 1904. Um, by uh, a couple of months into that war, the Herero almost defeated the Germans just almost like uh, they managed to defeat, uh, just it's how the Ethiopians managed to defeat, um, uh, how the Ethiopians managed to defeat uh, the Italians. And the Germans, as a retaliation measure, mounted a force of some 15,000 soldiers and, um, uh, and uh, brought those to German Southwest Africa in order to embark on what was an actual extermination policy in the end. And uh, the method was to um, push um, the Herero into the desert and make them cross that desert towards Botswana, so turning the desert basically into uh, the perpetrator of the genocide. Um, an official extermination order was issued by the commanding offer, uh, officer, which committed to paper that uh, all Herero who returned from the desert should be shot. Um, that extermination order actually was so controversial at the time that it was withdrawn. Uh, eventually, um, after many debates in Berlin, 
but uh, nevertheless, you actually have an order uh, on paper uh, where that was said, which is you know the many parallels that are drawn to the Holocaust, uh, the Nazi Holocaust, um, uh, is that you know the Nazis use many euphemisms, uh, trying to hide often, you know, blew up the gas chambers in Auschwitz uh, when they lost the war. So here it was a far more open almost celebrated, you know, I mean, people took postcards in Namibia of this stuff and sent it back to their loved ones, you know. Skulls were shipped from Namibia to Germany for private collections uh, of the genocide. So um, I don't want to bother you with this horrific image so much, but Skara, do you want to uh, elaborate a bit uh, on what happened in 1904? Yes, thank you so much, um, Robert. Uh, my name is Skara. Uh, my surname is Matundu. Because of the genocide, I was born in the neighboring country called Botswana, as these guys fled Namibia during the um, my great father. They managed to reach Botswana safely, even though they were being pursued by the German soldiers. And that's how maybe I came to see the light of day. Um, when you look at these pictures, some people would uh, now and then get surprised and, you know, touched in what have you. I, for one, I have come to say, if I were to be kind of touched by these pictures, it means I might not tell the story. So basically, basically to us, they have just become part of our history. And if we are afforded that opportunity, we would always like to tell the story about what happened. One thing that is so interesting is that all these were recorded by the Germans. There are so many of them, so many pictures that some of you guys, uh, I know you won't stand the side of such pictures, but um, the Germans, particularly the soldiers, they recorded. There's one that is quite interesting, uh, also captured in the Blue Book, whereby these guys, the sol that is the soldiers now, as they were tracking these people, they came across dead bodies, only one, uh, infant who was alive and they started tossing this infant around themselves just like a ball they tossed it around them laughing shouting and then subsequently when they tired one of them um, indicated that it must be thrown to him and then he'll catch the baby on the bayonet that's how sad basically this was and um, the war broke out somewhere in January in a place called Okahanja more central of the country but then uh, the Germans under uh, Governor Ludwig, they, they just fought many battles with the Herero until one last battle that I would call very interesting, that was in Okanjira, where the Germans actually suffered a lot of you know, casualties. And this angered the whole of Germany, particularly back home, the Kaiser himself, and many. And that's how they decided to send uh, General von Trotta. And von Trotter, as history has it, this was the guy who was so successful in quelling so many rebellions, like in East India, China, China rather, Tanzania. So basically, von Trotter was not just picked. There were quite a number of them. But he came out above the rest because of his record. And that's how he was sent to Germany. And it's very interesting that when he arrived in Namibia, they had a debate with Ludwig, who had been living there as a governor. And Ludwig was more senior because, as a governor, he was the representative of the of the of the of the country, Germany. That is, but they had different views how they should conduct the war. Ludwig, his idea was to defeat the Herero in one huge battle and extend a hand of truce. But actually, von Trotter had none of those. He said that these guys must be basically extincted from the mother earth. Uh, they they had a, a strong argument, the two of them. But then, eventually, von Trotter made it sure that Ludwig was removed. Uh, at some point, he had to be even sent back to Germany so that he doesn't disturb this guy to carry out his um, extermination order. Um, one thing very interesting is the fact that when he arrived, he's, he instructed all the soldiers just to encircle the Oba Herero and not fight them so that they wait for him so that he can carry out this. But uh, that was in Hamakari. But that, of course, uh, they fought that battle. And then, subsequently, we fled because we could not stand the might of, of the German army. You would appreciate the fact that 
The Hereros never had guns as such. They had just a few, and mainly we were using traditional weapons. And it was massive. They lost, and they, 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 they fled. And that's how Von Trotter was so much upset. And he trained them until a place called Odombudo Vindimba. Odombudo Vindimba means uh, wells where, because these people eventually they were dying this horrible death, they didn't know what was causing that. But actually, the, the, the German soldiers had poisoned all the wells around that area. So these guys, they would come thirsty as they were being driven, like um, Robert indicated, they were driven into the desert. And they became thirsty. They came across these wells. They drank that water, and it was poisoned. And that's how they died. And those who arrived late when the water was finished, apparently, according to Dr. Carol Poole, who wrote a very interesting you know, book on this whole history, those who came late, they would open the stomachs of those that were lying there dying, and they would try to salvage the little bit of water and from their stomach, and that water was already poisoned, and that's how they died. And the, like um, Robert indicated, uh, the whole thing is, the idea was, Firstly, to drive these guys into the into the desert so that they can die of thirst, because in his order, von Trotta indicated that he is not going to accept you know what we would call prisoners of war, like women, children. He said they must just shot, they must be shot at, or driven into the desert so they can die there. One of these methodology was to drive them into the desert, and you realize when you look at the Holocaust, some of these methodologies were used during the Holocaust. Uh, when they were killing the, the, the Jews. Uh, and uh, one was to drive them into the desert, the other one was poisoning, like I indicated, and then shot at indiscriminately. Later on, after the war, there came the concentration camps. These guys were captured, those that were captured. They were put into these camps just to die there of thirst, hunger, cold, because this way in the, in, the, in, the, in the desert, and as you might appreciate the desert at night, it becomes quite, you know, Cold, and these were the people who were. Imagine those are the pictures. These were the guys that were captured and then taken into the camps. They were stabbed, actually, as you can see, and subsequently they died. Uh, and the uh, the idea, in a nutshell, if I may finalize with this, is that I did a research on genocide when I was finishing my LLB degree. I just wanted to find out whether this is a crime that can be pursued up to now since it happened then. <laughs> Uh, apart from looking at that, one of the things that are clear in my research is that this genocide idea was not just carried by von Trotter in the Bush day in Africa. Actually, it was mapped out in Germany by the Kaiser himself who was involved. This idea of poisoning water, it was an idea that was given by a, an ordinary German resident who, in, who, who thought, because these guys were very arrogant, they had killed German soldiers, cutting off their ears and what have you. One methodology that they could successfully eliminate these guys was food poisoning. I mean, rather poisoning their, their mm -hmm. water and, and you name it. So basically to me and my research, uh, the genocide idea, as I indicated, it was not born in the bush in Africa. It was something that was crafted in Germany, the Kaiser, Wilhelm II being involved, and the rest of his uh, you know, senior interrogate, if you like. Uh, basically, that's it, and I hope uh, through questioning, maybe you guys can come up with more questions. We'll be ready to clarify. And 